Hello. Today I want to talk about Adler's concept of the inferiority complex and about his break with Freud. I will discuss other aspects of his ideas in a third video. Adler was a prolific writer who published over 300 books and articles, but much of his output consisted of lectures delivered to the general public. Also, his busy work schedule and relatively early death did not allow him the time to systematically revise and correlate his ideas. Again, he developed many of his major ideas over time, so that the role of some of them, such as the famous inferiority complex, shifts over the years. Nor was he concerned to establish or enforce an Adlerian orthodoxy similar to that developed by the Freudians. Although an early supporter of Freud's ideas, Adler was also critical of some aspects of the older man's works, and from very early on in their association with each other, he began to develop his own distinctive understanding of how the mind worked. Ultimately, these differences of approach proved irreconcilable, and in 1911, Adler and his followers broke away from the Freudians to form their own separate group, later adopting the term individual psychology to describe their approach. Adler's first major contribution to depth psychology focused on what came to be called the inferiority complex, a concept which he changed and developed over time. Initially, prior to the split with Freud, Adler thought in terms of an individual psychological compensation for some perceived physical defect or inferiority. One response to such a sense of inferiority and weakness was overcompensation by excessive striving. A good classical example was the Athenian orator Demosthenes, originally a stutterer who forced himself to become a highly effective public speaker. For us, other examples might include the future American president, Teddy Roosevelt, originally a weakling who struggled to develop his physical prowess, or the philosopher Nietzsche, who was physically infirm but wrote a philosophy of power. Overcompensation was also found in the so-called masculine protest, the striving by some men to be seen as strong and powerful in compensation for feelings of being unmanly. Male aggression, for example, developed from felt inferiority. Overcompensation was only one possible response, however. A child might also respond to a sense of inferiority by becoming entirely submissive. Beyond these initial insights, Adler argued that the sense of inferiority was relative to a person's environment. Thus, in a social world in which women were made to feel inferior in many ways, then they too might respond with extreme submissiveness or by their own equivalent of masculine protest. More generally, Adler later saw inferiority as a universal experience for children who, by the very fact of being children, were small and dependent on adults. Adults who were big and strong and tried to control everything that the child did. However, Adler also realized that for most children this was just a phase in their lives that ceased as they became adults. It only produced neurosis when children used it as an excuse not to do that which they were capable of doing. It was properly called an inferiority complex when it continued to dominate the individual's later adult life. These developing understandings increasingly diverged from what was becoming Freudian orthodoxy. Adler's approach came to explicitly minimize the role of the sexual element which Freud believed to be so fundamental to understanding unconscious life. Instead, Adler focused on the relationship between the individual and their family members and others, in particular in terms of perceived differences of power. It was problems in the individual's social interactions with others, rather than inadequate sexual development, which underlay neurosis. Moreover, for Adler, the infant's psychological development was primarily linked to its changing relationship with the outside world rather than the internal psychosexual development outlined by Freud. For Freud, 
Adler's early work could be seen as a useful contribution to understanding the functioning of the ego, but by neglecting the complex dynamics between ego id and superego was ultimately superficial. Also, by denying the primacy of the sex drive, Adler undermined what Freud saw as the fundamental motivating force for the development of the human psyche. For his part, Adler later referred to Freud's obsession with the mythology of sex and rejected the pansexualism of Freud's libido theory. Instead, Adler believed that many elements of Freudian theory could be reinterpreted in terms of the psychology of power and competence. Even the Oedipus complex, if it occurred, stemmed from the dependency of the pampered child on the mother rather than Freud's sexual dynamic. Just like hunger and thirst, sexual feelings existed, but these biological factors only became psychologically important through the striving for superiority. Again, whilst Adler accepted that there were unconscious motivations for human behavior and psychological development, he stressed the importance of ego functions more. His was a perspective that overlapped with important elements of Freud's theory, but was fundamentally and distinctively different. Adler also saw dreams in a quite different way from Freud. It might well be that dreams revealed deep-rooted neuroses, but Adler felt that they were more likely to represent a vicarious solution to the individual's problems by planning for the future. They were also important in revealing the patient's underlying emotional state. Adler came to psychotherapy from a similar background to Freud in that he worked in a clinical setting with disturbed individuals and his therapeutic approach emerged in interaction with them. But the style of therapy which he developed was quite different from Freud's. Unlike Freud, he regarded the patient's specific social setting as fundamental and emphasized the importance of the individual's own attitudes and understanding in resolving whatever problems he or she had. Rather than a detached voice removed from the gaze of the patient by the arrangement of the analyst's chair and the patient's couch, Adler liked to adopt an open, face-to-face -face approach and was more conversational, sympathetic and encouraging, appealing to the patient's sociality and trying to help him or her to find their own solution. In particular, he held that encouragement was essential, as when a patient's exaggerated feelings of inferiority had led to an inferiority complex and given them a sense of discouragement. This approach was particularly striking in dealing with troubled children, a major category of the patients he met. Thus, he questioned the child directly, like a contemporary, using simple language, trying to make quick insights on their first meeting as to the relevant problems to address. For example, meeting a discouraged child who had the desire to shine, Adler deliberately sat down on a step lower than the child's. Or talking to a boy with a strong temper, he asked what he liked to do, and when being told football, Adler asked conspiratorially whether or not it was fun barging into other boys. Or meeting a child who was a show-off, Adler stood up on tiptoe and back, saying that there were other ways of making himself bigger than disrupting the class. Again, unlike Freud, Adler never insisted on long, drawn-out training for practitioners of his method. He thought that sympathetic empathy for the patient was far more important than intensive and complex ideas of psychotherapy. Given that a lot of his work focused on the treatment of troubled children, he welcomed the large number of practicing teachers who attended his lectures and sought to emulate his methods, finding many successful therapists amongst this group. Nor was there any insistence on privacy, and his clinics with children were often conducted in front of anyone who wished to attend, such as parents and teachers. Thank you.